Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers police commands, vehicle searches, and speeding arrests, and is brought to us by The States Channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On June 25th, 2013, South Carolina Highway Patrol Trooper Lance Corporal R.S. Salter pulled over Cincinnati Bengals defensive lineman Sam Montgomery in Lawrence County, South Carolina for driving 89 miles per hour in a 55 miles per hour zone. The incident, which received national attention was captured on Trooper Salter's dash cam. See your hands, please. Do not move. You the only one in here? Yep. You military? Nope. NFL? Yes, sir. You're under arrest. Step out, please. What I do? 89 and a 55. Keep your hands where I can see them. Oh. Step out, please. You're under arrest. Four. Turn around, face that way, please. Turn around, face that way, please. Spread your feet, spread your feet, wider, wider, wider. Point your toes out, reach back with your hands. Sound of my voice, look forward. Do not look at me, reach out, palms up. Reach out, palms up, toward me. Back, hands behind your back, palms up. Hands behind your back, palms up, toward the sky. Do not move, look away from me, look away. Look away, keep your feet together. Sir, if you cannot follow my commands, the next thing you're gonna get is a taser. Trooper Salter shouts a series of confusing and often contradictory commands at Mr. Montgomery, and then threatens to tase him as he struggles to understand the commands and comply. It has been well documented that human perception can become distorted in high-stress situations, making it hard to focus on and comply with police officers. For this reason, police best practices generally require officers to issue clear and concise commands to help ensure that suspects can understand them. Lexipol, a public safety policy consultant that works with police departments, states that quote, too much information can cause misunderstanding or confusion. Commands should be short and easy to understand. And don't give conflicting orders. If you start yelling one thing and then something different, the suspect may not be able to process and respond. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts Municipal Police Training Committee Recruit Officer Course on Motor Vehicle Stops provides similar guidance, stating, quote, effective communication by police during motor vehicle stops is critical for safety, taking enforcement action, and building positive community relationships, and encouraging officers to, quote, be clear, concise, and cordial. Use a normal voice tone and cadence to talk with occupants, not at them. The curriculum then asserts that officers should greet drivers by stating their name and law enforcement agency, and that, quote, absent a specific need to remove driver or passengers, instruct all occupants to remain seated inside vehicle with doors closed. If the occupant does need to be removed from the vehicle, officers should, quote, request and wait for backup to arrive first, remove passengers one at a time, gather all passengers together in a safe location. It is unclear why Trooper Salter believed it was necessary to order Mr. Montgomery out of the vehicle, and there are many aspects of the approach he took with Mr. Montgomery that do not comply with modern policing standards. Similarly, a suspect failing to comply with orders would not be sufficient grounds for an officer to use a taser under today's applicable legal standards. In the 2016 case of Armstrong v. Village of Pinehurst, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over the state of South Carolina, determined that, quote, a police officer may only use serious injurious force, like a taser, when an objectively reasonable officer would conclude that the circumstances present a risk of immediate danger that could be mitigated by the use of force. At bottom, physical resistance is not synonymous with risk of immediate danger. Because Mr. Montgomery was not even physically resisting Trooper Salter, the use of a taser in this situation would have been unjustified under this standard. Spread your feet. Whoa, I'm not talking about Spread your feet. Palms up toward the sky behind your back. Do not move. Get 25 over, you get arrested. Five, four, four, six, six, seven, one time, four, Robert Mike. Push the license out, sir. What's in such a hurry for? I'm um, going home. Where do you live at? In Greenwood, South Carolina. Okay, what's your name? Sam. I'll go in my pocket. Kill somebody. You know. I was on the road by myself. I'm sorry. You passed two cars. You passed them. You passed them running. 89. I was just trying to get my mom. Stay here, sir. Yes, sir. Can I um have somebody come get my car up, make a phone call? Because I'm gonna have a situation. Please tell me I got a ten and I can still do it. Yes, sir. Oh, not too long as I call him by picking me up. Not good. You won't get up till about nine o'clock in the morning. Alright, come on. Come on, let me call him off. And 
phone? Can I get my phone? Yeah. I just have to Oh. Um, I don't know exactly where it is, but I need to get it. Okay. I don't need search. My car, bro. Mr. Montgomery asks Trooper Salter to retrieve his phone, and then privately remarks to himself that he was not offering permission to search the vehicle. While there is an exception to the warrant requirement that allows officers to search a vehicle incident to a lawful arrest, there are strict limitations on when such a search can be conducted. In the 2009 case of Arizona v. Gantt, the Supreme Court held that, quote, police may search a vehicle incident to a recent occupant's arrest only if the arrestee is within reaching distance of the passenger compartment at the time of the search, or it is reasonable to believe the vehicle contains evidence of the offense of arrest. When these justifications are absent, a search of an arrestee's vehicle will be unreasonable unless police obtain a warrant or show that another exception to the warrant requirement applies. Under this standard, Trooper Salter would not have been within his authority to search Mr. Montgomery's vehicle in this situation, as Mr. Montgomery was already in handcuffs and sitting in the cruiser. However, because Mr. Montgomery gave Trooper Salter permission to obtain his phone from the vehicle, under the plain view doctrine, Trooper Salter would have been able to seize any contraband or evidence that he could see in the vehicle while retrieving the phone. In the 1968 case of Harris versus United States, the Supreme Court upheld the admission as evidence of a registration card an officer found in plain view when lawfully inventorying an impounded vehicle. The court reached this decision because, quote, once the door had lawfully been opened, the registration card with the name of the robbery victim on it was plainly visible. It has long been settled that objects falling in the plain view of an officer who has a right to be in the position to have that view are subject to seizure and may be introduced in evidence. So while Trooper Salter technically could not lawfully search the vehicle, because Mr. Montgomery consented to him entering the vehicle to get his phone, he would have been able to seize any evidence found in plain view. It's also important to note that had Mr. Montgomery's vehicle been impounded, the vehicle could have been lawfully searched as part of a routine inventory search, as the Supreme Court concluded in the 1976 case of South Dakota versus Opperman. These caretaking procedures have almost uniformly been upheld by the state courts, which, by virtue of the localized nature of traffic regulation, have had considerable occasion to deal with the issue. Applying the Fourth Amendment standard of reasonableness, the state courts have overwhelmingly concluded that even if an inventory is characterized as a search, the intrusion is constitutionally permissible. However, in this situation, the police allowed Mr. Montgomery's mother to pick up the vehicle instead of impounding it so an inventory search would not have been justified. Five, one, five, four. You close? Let me search my car, bro. Yeah, and hit the talk button. Yeah. Oh no, that's just my mama. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, anything crazy, yes, sir. Thank you. Hey, mama, how you doing? Uh, I'm not in the best predicament, but it's not a bad one. Ouch. Um, I got arrested for going too fast. You got arrested for going too fast? Yeah, I was going like 89 and a 50. No. They they're gonna give me a ticket, but yeah, they arrested me. I'm, I'm literally like right down the street from home. Mr. Montgomery explains that he was arrested for speeding, which, under South Carolina law, Trooper Salter was within his authority to do. According to Section 56-5-1520 of the South Carolina Code, there are four categories of misdemeanor speeding offenses classified according to how much over the speed limit an individual is driving. The first three categories are speeding offenses where an individual drives less than 25 miles an hour above the posted speed limit. Speeding offenses within these classifications are punishable by fines only, ranging from $15 to $75. If an individual is driving more than 25 miles an hour above the posted speed limit, which Mr. Montgomery was allegedly doing in this situation, they can be punished by a fine of up to $200 and imprisoned for up to 30 days. No matter how fast an individual is going, the South Carolina Supreme Court held in the 1967 case of State v. DeBerry that, quote, a law enforcement officer is authorized to arrest a citizen for a misdemeanor such as speeding or reckless driving committed in his presence. On the 
other hand, some states have prohibited officers from arresting individuals for low-level offenses. For example, in the 2014 case of Shea v. Porter, the United States District Court in the District of Massachusetts explained that, quote, under Massachusetts law, a person may not be arrested solely for the offense of speeding. However, the fact that state law prohibits an arrest for a lower-level offense does not automatically make an arrest that violates the state statute unconstitutional. In the 2001 case of Atwater v. City of Lago Vista, the Supreme Court noted that, quote, if an officer has probable cause to believe that an individual has committed even a very minor criminal offense in his presence, he may, without violating the Fourth Amendment, arrest the offender. So while Trooper Salter's decision to arrest Mr. Montgomery instead of issuing him a citation may have demonstrated poor discretion, it was not unlawful or unconstitutional. Why would they arrest him for a speeding ticket? Man, this is Trooper Salter with Highway Pro. He's got he's got you on speakerphone in his car because he's because he isn't handcuffed. Yeah. Uh, at, 20, at, at, at 25 over the speed limit is an arrestable charge. Yes, sir. Okay. So at, at 25 over the speed limit, we're over here. We subject to take people to jail for that. Oh, I did not know that. Yes, ma'am. That's, that's considered excessive. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's certainly is horrible, isn't it? After arresting Mr. Montgomery, Trooper Salter took him to jail, where he spent the night before being released on a $355 bond. The speeding charge against Mr. Montgomery was eventually dismissed after Trooper Salter did not show up for court. Shortly after the incident, Trooper Salter was suspended pending an investigation by the Office of Professional Responsibility. In August of 2014, Trooper Salter was fired for violating agency policies, including conduct unbecoming of a state employee during his arrest of Mr. Montgomery. Trooper Salter had previously been disciplined for unprofessional conduct and making inappropriate comments. And in 2009, he received a verbal reminder of department policies when he failed to ticket or issue a warning to a South Carolina law enforcement division agent he stopped for driving 85 miles per hour in a 65 mile per hour zone. Overall, Trooper Salter gets an F for exercising poor discretion throughout the stop, issuing complicated and contradictory commands while threatening to tase Mr. Montgomery, and for maintaining a condescending and unprofessional attitude throughout the encounter. As mentioned, on many episodes of ATA, officers are afforded a considerable degree of discretion when carrying out their duties, and abusing that discretion or wielding it recklessly betrays both the trust of the public and the oath that members of law enforcement are sworn to. At times, Trooper Salter's commands were vague, indescribable, and often directly contradicted one another, and it likely would have confused almost anyone in Mr. Montgomery's position. The trooper also needlessly threatened to tase Mr. Montgomery for failing to comply with his confusing orders, despite the fact that Mr. Montgomery had been respectful and compliant since making contact with him. It could be argued that Trooper Salter's previous reprimand for not issuing a speeding citation may have influenced his decision to escalate this encounter into an arrest. However, considering that he was ultimately fired for his conduct in this interaction, it appears that Trooper Salter's superiors didn't see it that way, and probably for good reason. This interaction is a prime example of how an officer operating under law doesn't always equate to an officer operating in the best interest of the public. Mr. Montgomery gets an A, because although he could have invoked his right to remain silent more effectively, he remained calm and cordial throughout the encounter, did his best to comply with the trooper's commands, and followed up this interaction with the proper channel of complaint. Although Mr. Montgomery's charges were eventually dropped, if Trooper Salter had made an appearance in court, then he may have been convicted of speeding based on his admission of guilt on the scene. Beyond that, Mr. Montgomery was respectful, courteous, and understanding throughout the interaction, and his ability to remain calm and collected while being threatened with a taser for failing to obey contradictory orders is admirable. I commend Mr. Montgomery for peacefully enduring Trooper Salter's abuse of professional discretion. And I commend the South Carolina Office of Professional Responsibility for holding Trooper Salter accountable. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.